So uh, today's message, we're kicking off this new series, is a little more uh, introspective, if you will, and uh, just want to let you know that. I hope that you take some of the words in today uh, that we're going to be sharing. Um, I, I, the, the message really, especially uh, one part of it, it really hit home for me personally this week. You'll probably know when we get there because I get a little excited about it, but uh, uh, I hope you get a lot out of, out of this. First, though, I want to share a story with you. I can remember uh, when I went to Bible college, graduated high school in Indiana, went to Bible college in Joplin, Missouri, and uh, moved into the dorms there and, and all. And uh, I can remember my first roommate. He was one of these guys. If you know, if you know Shannon uh, Parsley, one of our elders, uh, who is like the main prankster in the entire church, that was my roommate, okay? You know, because you're his daughter. So, um, But uh, my roommate, he was like, he was always pulling pranks on everybody, you know? And so he had this, came up with this grand, grand scheme to pull a prank on everybody on my floor of the dormitory. And, uh, uh, and so we went to, I, I think it was a Kmart back then, you know? Uh, you know how you can, you can go in there and they have these, um, it's like you can flip through all of the posters, you know? It's like a vertical uh, file cabinet sort of thing. And it's all of the... The, the popular people, the movie stars, the music stars, everybody like that, and you can find the poster you want, and you can grab it and and uh, and take that poster and stuff. Any of you all remember the teen uh, superstar from the '80s, Debbie Gibson? Remember her? Yeah. Okay. So, so, so my roommate got this poster, hung it up on my side of the uh, the dorm, and then autographed it for Debbie Gibson. Okay, her name on the on the on the poster, and then he went and told only like two or three people uh, that I knew Debbie Gibson. Uh, the story was something like like our dads knew each other, and at one point I dated Debbie Gibson and all, and we're still really good friends and all this kind of stuff. All that's all he told him was like two or three people. And then all of a sudden, all these guys, like, like, like for weeks, kept coming and knocking on the door saying, can I see that poster? Can I see that poster, you know? And the lie evolved as well. You know, lives often evolve, right? You know, they often grow, you know? And, uh, and it grew. And, and so everybody thought that I was still dating her and they thought I was this huge thing and so important. And we, we just, we had so much fun with that lie, with all of the guys on my floor of the dormitory. You know how some lies are easier to believe than others, right? And, and how one lie might start sounding a little far-fetched, but then there are some details that are added to the, the lie to make it believe, believable, and then it begins to spread, and, and it kind of hangs around long enough that then, then a lot of people, are like when, when they hear that, are like, well, 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 yeah, I mean, of course that's, that's real. Of course that's the truth. I mean, it's always been like that, even though it's really still a lie, right? We're kicking off this, this series today. It's called The Jesus Lie, and for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the biggest Jesus lies out there, beliefs that, that many people believe are true, but are not. They're really not true. For example, which lie for you is easier for you to believe? Jesus is too loving, so loving that he'll never let anything bad happen to me, or Jesus is passive and disengaged with my life both of which are lies, by the way. But both of those, if you believe that either one of those lies, will lead you to asking the why question. Why is this happening? And the way you answer the why question will reveal a lot about you, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, right? It will reveal a lot about you, about your ideas, your perspective, what you believe about Jesus. And we all have those, right? No matter who you are, we all have those, these, these ideas, these beliefs about Jesus. And, and there's all kinds of things that have influenced our lives when it comes to what we think and what we believe about Jesus. For example, your upbringing has been huge in your life, has influenced you. Your parents, grandparents, loved ones has influenced you in what you think about Jesus, what you believe about him. No doubt uh, the media has influenced our views as well. Friends have influenced us. Uh, I, I believe Social media has incredibly, greatly influenced uh, us as far as what we think about 
Jesus. And I don't know how many times I've heard the story about the older teenager who graduates high school and is, has always been just rock solid in their faith, you know, I mean, and always, always huge in, in student ministry and stuff. And they go off to college and then there's this one little mainstream professor that plants one little seed in that person's mind. And now their views begin to morph. They begin to evolve a little bit. And so the question is, what's really true and what are the lies? Like how do we decipher between the truth and the Jesus lies? Things we've always been told, things we've always been taught. And like I said, how you view Jesus, your opinions and beliefs will ultimately determine how you answer the whole why question. Why is this happening to me? But What if our ideas, our beliefs about Jesus, our opinions about Jesus, what if they were wrong? What if what what we believe is not based on truth, but is based on lies, things that we've heard throughout the years? Three of the most predominant uh, views about Jesus, one is he's angry. He's just always angry with me, right? Right? I, he's, he's punishing me for all of the things that I've done wrong throughout my life. Uh, all of the bad things that happened to me is for a reason. It's because he's angry with me. But then there are those who have exactly the opposite view and they think that he's too loving. That Jesus, just like that, what I shared just a moment ago, that he's too loving to allow anything harmful to happen to you, anything bad to happen to you. And if you believe that lie, it would suggest that all of the bad things, negative things that happen to us in our life are outside of his control. Then there are others who, who would say he's passive, he's disengaged, doesn't really care about us nor what's happening in our everyday lives. And I mean, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you're a parent, you know, you kind of, every now and then you get fed up with the kids, right? It's just leave me alone already for just a, a little while, please, you know, give me a break, right? And so maybe you think he's passive and disengaged. All three of those. He's angry with me. He's too loving to let anything happen to me. He's passive. He's disengaged with me in my life. All three are lies. All three of them are lies. And so how do we decipher the truth from the lies? How do we figure that that out? And as we attempt to figure that out, a little hurdle comes into play that I just want to address real, real quick. And that is that for us, for I, w- I would say probably the majority of us here in this room, we call ourselves followers, we call ourselves Christians, we as a church, right? We would naturally lean on scripture to determine the difference between the lies and truth. Here at Gulf Coast Christian Church, we believe God's word is, is his inspired word and it is without error. It is inerrant, right? And so we would lean on, on scripture to find truth, but I, I think it's, it's worth at least acknowledging that there might be some people who wrestle with that. And I don't know where you're at with that, but please understand throughout this series, we will be looking in scripture and God's word to try to determine truth from the lies. So the question is, what do you believe about Jesus? Have you ever just stopped and thought, considered that question? What do you really believe about Jesus? Do you just believe what you've been told you know, your entire life? What you, what you learned in Sunday school? Is that what you believe, you know? Well, what do you really believe about Jesus? Because he, here's what I found, and I've experienced this as, as, as uh, uh, myself as well, is that I think all three of those predominant views right there, that Jesus is angry, he's too loving to let anything happen to me, he's passive and disengaged in my life. I think a lot of times, depending on the situation, we bounce between them ourselves, depending on what all is, is going on. And if we're wrong about Jesus, if our views and our beliefs about Jesus are wrong, we just might miss what Jesus is doing amidst the storms of life. Tony Evans once wrote this. He said, he's not sitting, Jesus, not sitting by as a spectator, He is the invisible hand working behind the scenes of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I want to borrow a few more words of his for our bottom line today. He also said, there are many times when God will use negatives to accomplish positives. 
there are many times that God will use negatives to accomplish positives. Like I said earlier, you ever notice how lies tend to grow, right? They tend to grow. You ever been caught in the situation of the growing lie or maybe caught somebody else, right? If you got kids, you've probably caught them in the middle of a, of a growing lie, right? You know, and, and the original lie has to sound believable. And so those details are, are added. Here's, here's the thing. Lies tend to birth lies, right? They tend to birth even more lies, it's the same thing when we fall into believing one of those lies that Jesus is angry or he loves me too much to let anything happen to me or he's passive, he's not engaged. Out of those, another lie is born. See if this sounds all too familiar, that if Jesus is silent, he must not care. Another lie. And the truth is this, even if Jesus is silent, it doesn't mean he doesn't care. That's the truth. I bet if we had the time to go around the room today and just share some stories, every single person here in this room, you would be able to share about a situation, probably numerous ones, that you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed. You got down on your knees, you burnt the midnight oil, you sought God out and you expected to hear from him and then it felt like you didn't. And you began to wonder in your mind, well, does he, is, did he hear me? Does he still care? There's, there's a, a, a word that we don't hear too often during the whole year until we get to Christmas time. It's a name that is often used for God, Emmanuel. And if you look up the original meaning of Emmanuel, it means God with us. God with us. Us. It's not God is far away from us. It's not God doesn't have time for us. It's not God doesn't care for us. What it really means is God with us means that he, he's always close to us. God with us means that he always has time for us. It means that he does care deeply for you so much that he will never leave you. Let me read that passage for you one more time from Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus, if you want him to, is always with you. And because he's always with you, guess what? Jesus knows. Jesus knows what's going on in your life. He fully understands everything that is going on in your life. He's not judging you. Jesus, he has empathy for you. You know what empathy is? Anybody like me that every time you think of sympathy and empathy, you got to go Google it just to remember the difference of it, you know? English teachers, you got it, but not me, you're right? So empathy in its, in its basic rawest form is, is in essence basically you trying to step into the shoes of somebody else to feel what they feel. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did for us? Stepped into, the, into our shoes to know what it's like. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He know what it, knows what it's like to, to wrestle with that. Every single thing that you've gone through, every single thing that you've yet to go through, Jesus knows, he understands. In Hebrews chapter four, verse 15, it says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. And so Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. He's, he's no, he also knows what it's like to feel emotions. Like Jesus was emotional. We read account after account of different emotions that, that Jesus experienced. There was one time he was angry. There, there was another time he was hurt and disappointed because a dear friend of his, he had just learned, a dear friend of his had passed away. And in one of the, the shortest passages in the Bible, John chapter 11, says Jesus wept. He was hurt. He knows that emotion. And he knows what it's like to face overwhelming circumstances. It's what we talked about last week. Last weekend, Easter weekend, right? Right before he is arrested and turned over to be tried before going to the cross. He's praying in the garden. In Matthew chapter 26, he prays, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. 
In the Gospel of Luke, if you read that, we're told that Jesus prayed so passionately that the sweat that rolled off his brow was like blood dripping off of him. I've never prayed that hard. I don't know about y'all. Jesus knows what life is like for you completely. Completely. He understands when you're hurt. He understands when you're disappointed. Jesus understands when you're frustrated and angry and ready to give up. He knows. He understands the tension that arises at home with your family, with your children, in your marriage, at your workplace. He understands the stress. He understands the anxiety. He understands what it's like to worry. Because he's been there, done that, Jesus understands. He knows. He knows. And even when he is silent, it doesn't mean he doesn't care. Maybe, maybe in his times of silence, it's him working behind the scenes that we cannot see to bring positives out of our negatives. So if, if, if Jesus isn't disengaged with us, if he's, if he's not too loving, if he's not angry with us, how do we understand his role in our lives? Now, there's many roles for him in our lives, but I think one of the biggest ones that we wrestle to fully understand is this one right here. And this is some of the stuff that really grabbed a hold of me this week. There's a, an account in the gospel of, of John chapter nine, Jesus' disciples wrestling with this exact thing, this exact same, same thing. Right? They're just trying to understand why. Why is this happening? I mean, Jesus, don't you even care? Like, you could do something about this. Don't you even care, right? As they're walking along one day, they come across this, this man who has been blind from birth. Okay, he's, he's this blind guy. It's such a horrible thing. The disciples are like, why? Why, you know, why would this ever happen? You've asked that question before, right? I know I have. I've asked that question many times throughout my life. Why? Like, when I was in the seventh grade, why did my dad have to be, go through that car accident that instantly turned my family's life completely upside down? Why? Right? Why was my wife and my daughter and myself in the car accident we were in several years ago that turned our lives upside down? Why, when I am at a, a church in Georgia, a large church, very stable church, financially stable church, I'm set, why would God get inside of my heart and push me and nudge me to go plant a church in Pensacola when he fully knew that COVID was gonna kick off in about 12 months and shut everything down, the world down and shut our doors down? Why? You've asked the why questions, haven't you? What's the point? And so Jesus and the disciples, they're walking along, right? They see this, this blind guy and they, they ask Jesus, Jesus, why is this guy born blind? And before Jesus can speak one single word, they start trying to answer their own question, right? For themselves. They say things like, well, was it because of his own sins or maybe his sins he's going to commit? Maybe his parents' sins, right? And, and obviously they're making an assumption in this. They're assuming that this, this, this man is being punished for something he's done or will do or has something that his parents have done. We love playing the blame game, don't we? I mean, it's just, it just happens most of the time. I mean, there's always got to be somebody to blame for all of the horrible things that, that happen in our lives, right? Somebody's got to be at fault. And honestly, it's true. Sometimes, sometimes we suffer because of our own behavior, and our own decisions. And sometimes we may suffer because of the decisions of someone else. But Jesus here, he surprises him with this answer. He basically says, no, no, no. It wasn't because of his sins. It wasn't because of his parents' sins. Jesus basically says there is no one to blame here. Look at this. John chapter 9, beginning with verse 1, says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And here's Jesus' response. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. And here it is. What is the role of Jesus in my life? 
But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Could it be that the that because my dad went through that car accident and my family was turned completely upside down, God is now going to use it so that God might be displayed in him. Could it be that what you have gone through and maybe are going through right now in this life, you're going through so that God might be displayed through you? In other words, sometimes God will use our negatives to create some positives. Andy Stanley said it like this. He said, sometimes God chooses to display his power on the platform or stage of our pain and our suffering. Jesus knows. He understands. He has empathy with you because he literally stepped into the shoes of mankind. He knows what is going on, even though sometimes we don't. That's frustrating, isn't it? Jesus knows, even though sometimes we won't know. We won't know. He fully understands our hangups, our, 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 our hurts. And, and while he's able to get up here and he's able to see the bigger picture of what's going on, it's frustrating sometimes because we won't be able to see that. It won't be revealed to us. Isaiah chapter 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And what that tells me is that somehow, some way, God will be revealed through our hurt. And sometimes Jesus will know exactly what's going on. And sometimes it won't be revealed to you. We won't understand. I mean, think about the last few years, right? From COVID to the recent war on the other side of the globe. I mean, how many innocent people have died because of COVID? How many innocent people have died because of that war? Is, is, I mean, surely that's not God's plan, right? Surely that's not God's desire. And I don't believe that it is his desire. But because it is happening, God will use those circumstances to bring about his glory, so that he might be revealed to bring positives out of the negatives. And it may take weeks, it may take months, it may take years, but he will reveal himself. I, 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 think, it's, I think it's easy to allow ourselves sometimes to be convinced that Jesus doesn't care because we've fallen for the Jesus lie that, that if God is truly sovereign, he holds all power in the universe, right? And if he holds all powerful, then he's surely powerful enough to stop all of these horrible situations that the world presents to us. You know what I think one of the, one of the hurdles is for us? I think it's found in how we might define power. Because many of us would define that a little differently. You know, maybe, maybe power to you is a, a physical presence, you know, like the rock, Right? I've never met the rock, but I can only imagine if he was standing in front of me and I'm looking up to him, I would think there is a lot of power in those guns versus these guns, right? Which are kind of more like BB guns, you know? All right? That, that's power, you know? Maybe you think of a military, a military power, right? Maybe you would define power as the ability to dominate over another person or another army or another country. And if, if we would define power as any of the above, then we would naturally probably define God's power similarly, wouldn't we? And if we do, we just might miss one of God's greatest powers of all. Don't miss this. Please don't miss this. From what I have seen, at least, more often than not, God's power is on display in the form of love. It's one of God's greatest powers, is love. We celebrated it last week with the resurrection, right? And, I, and, I, and if you were here, I, I said this, if, if God has the desire and, and the ability and the power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead, surely he has the ability, the power, and the desire to raise you 
as well to help us begin to start living again. But as long as we are looking for these giant, huge, honking acts of power, we'll miss one of his greatest powers of all, his love for you and for me. And here's the thing. While often God's greatest power is his love, often how he chooses to display that power and love is through you and me. It's one of the greatest things that other people can see is God through you. God desires to bring about positives out of people's negatives. And he wants to use you to do it. Perhaps today, what you need more than anything is to just be reminded. You know what? Jesus is not angry with you. It's not that he's so loving that he'll never allow anything bad to happen to you. It's not that Jesus is passive and disengaged and It's way far off from me. Maybe what you need more than anything right now is just to be reminded that Jesus is active and he does care about you and he is always with you and he does have a purpose for you in this life. Maybe right now you just need to be reminded Jesus knows, he understands, and he cares. And even through all of the life negatives that life may throw at you, Jesus will always bring about positives. And friends, to believe anything else, well, that would be a lie. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can know of your great power And that one of your greatest powers is displayed through each of us. The power of your love. That somehow, some way, that you can take all of our negatives and bring such positive things out of them. Things that that we see as just devastating. Things that maybe seem like a, a dead end road. Things that just suck every bit of hope out of our hearts and out of our minds. It's a mystery to us, but somehow you can bring positives out of that. Father, for any person here in this room right now, that's in the middle of a negative situation, whatever that is, in their marriage, in their home, in their workplace, financially, health, God, I I don't, I don't know what it is, but they find themselves right in the middle of a storm of life today. God, would you let them know Jesus cares and Jesus understands and that he is still right there with each of them. Show us some positives, God, and let us be available to be used by you to show those positives. I pray this in the powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.